Hi, everyone. Hi, Maria. So good to see you. Um, you know, Maria, this is um, a very challenging session for me right now. Okay. Um, usually, you know, our conversations uh, take closer to 20 hours. <laughs> now we have closer to 20 minutes. Okay. So we'll have to make, make it quick. You know, Blaise Pascal said uh, about a letter that he wrote, it would be shorter if I had more time, more well, challenging. Right, right. Um, so, Maria, you know what I thought we could uh, do today? You know, together, uh, a few years ago, we created a model uh, on happiness called the Spire model alongside Megan McDonough. And the model basically takes happiness and breaks it down into its elements. And Spire stands for spiritual well being, physical well being, intellectual well being relational well-being and emotional well-being why don't we go over this model and uh, uh each each of us can uh, introduce maybe an uh, an intervention or an idea that parents can use during these uh, difficult times beautiful i love that idea so the first letter of spire we're jumping right into this no time right <laughs> we're not wasting time no uh spiritual well-being Mm -hmm. So spiritual well-being, uh, if I may, uh, may start uh, talking a little bit about meditation. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Daniel Goleman spoke about this age being the age of distraction. And uh, he was talking about this way before COVID-19. I think even more so today, we're distracted by news, by views, by cues. And um, what we need, what our, what our kids need, are um, what I've come to call islands of sanity. And these islands of sanity are uh, periods during the day when we are rather than multitasking all over the place, single tasking in the here and now. So uh, whether it's sitting down and meditating, uh, taking in deep breaths, focusing on the breath going in and out, whether it's doing a, a yoga routine, uh, whether it is uh, eating, you know, we can be very mindful of, of, the, of the taste and the, and the smells, uh, whether we're talking and chatting or whether we're listening to music. So we can meditate, be mindful formally or informally. The key is to single task, to being the present. And we, when we have these islands of sanity, it's sort of like um, pushing the reset button uh, from all the stress and the rising stress, you know, that, that so many of us are, have talked about it. Uh, earlier. So under spiritual well-being, Maria. I love that. And what I love about that is that it really uh, brings the person into the place where they are become more at home in themselves, right? That island within oneself. Spirituality or this S of spire also can bring us back out into the world. And I think we can use this domain as the domain of connection to something larger than oneself, the island within and also the world without. And to do to use the, the spiritual aspect of ourselves to cultivate meaning, meaning, meaning what matters to us, what impassions us, what excites us, where that sort of zest or exuberance for living is and to track that, meaning literally ask ourselves, what is meaningful to me in this moment now, even in the presence of COVID, and how can I prioritize that in my life? What we know about meaning is that as we elevate meaning, we elevate a sense of greater satisfaction in life, often a greater sense of optimism, and also a sense of significance. Life, even as it is now, starts to feel like it matters more, and my life matters more. So I would add to that beautiful island, that sense of moving out in the world through meaning. Great. Um, so we, after spiritual well-being, we have uh, physical well-being. And, uh, you know, there's so much to talk about here. Um, but what I thought of focusing on is um, our ability to focus, to deal with stress. Again, stress levels are at an all-time high. And that is after they were at an all-time high before COVID-19. Right. So this is uh, compound <laughs> through the roof. And um, so what do we do about it? And I think the best thing we can do about it is not be afraid of stress, because if you think about it, stress is natural. It's something we all go through and we can deal with it. We're actually very good at dealing with stress. You know, it's like going to the gym and lifting weights. 
and when you lift weights, you, um, um, you are stressing your muscles, not a problem. You actually grow stronger as a result of it. Mm -hmm. If you have time for recovery right. and this is what, um, uh, what is needed so much during this time is to put times for recovery. And again, time for recovery can be meditation, of course, uh, but time for recovery can be um, just uh, going for a walk with uh, with my family, just uh, having a, a, a quiet cup of coffee. Uh, it could be uh, reading. It could be watching my favorite sitcom. Um, here's a plug for The Big Bang Theory or whatever it is. <laughs> Um, but, but having these periods of recovery throughout the day, not going, not thinking about the day, well, it's a marathon. And at the end, I'll just, you know, drop down and, and die, but rather every hour or two, take a, a short period of recovery. And that will enable us to physically, uh, as well as mentally, because mind and body are one, um, deal with, with the stress, grow from the stress, just as we grow from the stress in the gym. Sure. You know what, what I'm appreciating is that you are, we're somehow both capturing the spectrum of the inner and the outer life at the same time under the same domain. So in the physical realm, I mean, you and I are both in 100% agreement that if we only had one thing to offer anybody in terms of happiness or well being, we'd start with exercise. Like, if you could only do one thing, move your body, right? Move the body. We are creatures born to move. And in terms of COVID, I love, I was listening to the chat before, but the experts, beautiful experts on talking about parenting tips. And at the end, they were saying, you know, approach each child as an individual. And as individual human beings, we all have different longings for moving our body, what actually supports us in generating those neurochemicals that bolster um, and reduce pessimism and bolster optimism. So it's about exercise, but I would say even more carefully, movement that actually enlivens us. So get out in the world, get out into the other room, jump on the bed, full permission, jump on the bed, <laughs> roll on the couch, like find a way to move your body in a way that enlivens you. Yeah, no, I, I, I couldn't agree more. You know, um, my wife, Tommy, can tell when I haven't exercised for, for two days. We, uh, we can know, all tell, though. Rougher on the edges. So uh, <laughs> um, it, it makes a difference. And, you know, I'm thinking as we're going through the spire elements, these are, these are basics. I mean, these are things that are important any day. Um, going back to basics is especially important uh, these days. It's absolutely crucial. There's just too much to take in. And so the foundational principles that we know work and practices are, are absolutely the ticket. Okay, so let's move on to the I of SPIRE. Uh, the I of SPIRE, the I stands for intellectual yeah. well-being. Um, what I want to propose here is curiosity. Oh, um, so, um, you know, curiosity, there's a lot of research on curiosity by Todd Gash, Todd Cashden and, and, and many others. What people don't know is just how important curiosity is. You know, that people who are curious, who ask questions or are constantly learning new things actually live longer. Again, this goes to the connection between mind and body again. So, um, People who ask questions, who learn, always important, especially important now. So what does this actually look like? Well, it means uh, uh, reading, if that's your thing. It means, uh, you know, watching short lectures. It means attending conferences on parenting or, or any other topic. It's about learning new things. And when we learn new things, our, our, our mind is engaged. Uh, we are engaged. And um, that doesn't just contribute to being more mindful in islands of, of sanity. It also contributes to our physical health, the mind body connection. So in intellectual well being here, we have a trickle effect to the other uh, elements of spire. So learn new things, read new things, go out into nature. Uh, Ellen Langer, my teacher talks about how we need to um, draw novel distinctions. So even if it's the same street and you can only leave your home, you know, 500 meters or, you know, 100 yards, even if it's only that, you can always find new details, create novel distinctions. Um, even if you're looking at the same people for the past six months because you are in uh, lockdown, yeah. still novelty is possible. Curiosity may, may kill the cat, 
but it enlivens people. You know, last night I found myself Googling, what do people do for hobbies? Because I'm not traveling for work. I'm, I'm here in Zoom, Zoom universe. And I thought, I, I need to find some new hobbies. So I started Googling and I realized I was asking the wrong question. The wrong, right question, of course, is what excites me? What's, what, I'm, what am I in, in, in passionate about? What makes me smile? What makes me happy? And to be curious about ourselves in that way is so crucial. I, I just want to add to this domain, however, the precursor perhaps to curiosity for many of us, which is reducing anxiety first so that we can open the mind to be curious. Many of us under times of stress like this find ourselves caught in what Karen Rivich from Penn calls those negative thought habits where we jump to conclusions or we catastrophize or we take things personally or we we minimize the positive in the that we're seeing in the world and maximize the negative. And so, you know, Dr. Rivich and many others have these beautiful prompts which essentially invite us to do one thing, which is to ask ourselves to, to not always believe the thought that we're thinking and ask ourselves what other story might be true, which now that I think about it is a kind of curiosity question. So if I'm making an assumption that someone doesn't like me because I haven't heard back from them quickly, what other story might be true? If, if I sent a proposal to a company and they didn't respond, is it that they don't like my idea or they don't want to work with me or what other explanation is possible? So to bring our minds to a more curious sort of other story place in order to mm -hmm. diminish anxiety so that we can explore the world within us and around us a little bit more vibrantly. You know, Maria, as, as you're talking, um, I'm thinking and appreciating your connection to stories. Yeah. Um, you know, in, uh, in physics, physicists have for a long time looked for the unifying theory of the universe. Uh, so um, <laughs> unifying theory of everything. So, you know, whether it's Hawking's or Einstein or, uh, you know, Max Planck, they've all thought about it. And, you know, no one found it. And, you know, maybe there isn't one and maybe, you know, only God knows what the unifying theory is. Um, but I do think there is a unifying theory of psychology, and that is stories. Wow. You know, so you brought up stories as being so important in terms of changing our narrative and that helping us uh, um, think about and uh, resolve many of the issues that we're going through. And if you think about stories elsewhere, you know, what, it, what is going to the therapist all about? It's about telling our story and feeling better as a result. Yeah. Or, you know, what are the, um, this research on the greatest leaders? Who are the greatest leaders? They're storytellers. Uh, you think about memory, uh, research in cognitive psychology. What do we remember best? Not statistics. We remember stories wherever you look, uh, whether it's in developmental psychology, cognitive psychology, um, clinical psychology, what you find stories at the center. So when you bring uh, stories uh, to the fore, I think it's so important for our intellectual uh, cultivation, which is also an opportunity, you know, read stories together. You know, what did people do when they were, you know, 200 years ago when there was no uh, uh, internet, you know, or, uh, you know, 500 years ago when there was so far less stimulation out there. And uh, today, and what they did was they shared stories. I think this is a good opportunity to go back to that. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, we are all actually in media rest, right? In the middle of the story of our living. And I think these tools and practices actually ground us in the possibility of being in the middle of the story, just as it is, and finding a new path through the forest, one that is actually more health giving and life giving. Great. So um, this chapter of our story is just 20 minutes long, so I'm going to have to move on to the <laughs> R of Aspire. I got carried away a little bit. <laughs> so uh, when it comes to the R of Aspire, and here I want to build on something that uh, Shirley and Judith talked about in the previous, uh, in the previous session, and that is um, how today we can't have the same kind of relationships. You know, if I was um, talking on, on, on in this... Um, conference on parenting puzzle or to any other audience, the distinction that I would make would be between real relationships and virtual relationships. And what I would say is that um, virtual, re you know, 1000 friends on social media are no substitute for that one best friend. And all the research shows that that, that, that is true, unfortunately. 
so we need the real. However, making this distinction today is, is mute, is unhelpful. Yeah. Because today, for so many people, all that they have, all that we have with many of the important people in our lives, they are online virtual relationships. Um, so the distinction between virtual and real is unhelpful. There is, however, another important distinction that we need to make today, and that is between superficial and deep relationships okay superficial and deep you know sending a few emojis mm -hmm. lols you know that's superficial relationships um speaking on the phone for an hour with my dearest parents or uh, going on zoom with uh you maria and and chatting that can be a deep interaction yeah not ideal, not perfect. Yes, as you know, Shirley pointed out, I, you know, I wish we could go back to the days when we hugged and there's real research showing that you know, people who hug a lot are happier. Mm -hmm. The reason why Israelis in general are among the happiest uh, people in the world is because of the, the, the intimacy, the closeness. Um, again, with the, with the upsides and downsides, mostly upsides, it turns mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. So... We can't have that anymore, but we still can have deep relationships. I mean, think about it. You know, I spoke about 200 years ago. 200 years ago, people had deep relationships through letter writing. Right. You know, this is a good time to, you know, to dig deep into our, um, into our primal nature, into our history. And using modern technology, um, create deep relationships in a new way. Absolutely. Absolutely. And one of the new ways that I've been enlivening this R element of Spire for myself and, and my students has to do with considering the lineages that we come from. I, at the beginning of COVID, I was overwhelmed like many of us and stressed and sad. And I found that the typical ways of connecting weren't quite nourishing enough. And I found myself one evening remembering my Sicilian grandmother who came to this country, not speaking the language, didn't know anyone. And she lived through World War I, World War II, the Great Depression, Vietnam, Korea. And I, as I was remembering her story, I thought, Lord, you know, if she could live through that, I can live through COVID-19. And that opened up a conversation within myself about what other lineages do I attach to? Do I attach the women, the lineage of brave women who have changed their identities and their profession? Do I attach to a lineage of poets who I find deeply inspirational and, and exemplars of, of love of language, right? So we can use our lineages to remind ourselves of the, the inheritances that we have apprenticed ourselves to that are sometimes cellular and sometimes spiritual and sometimes simply that felt sense of I belong with that tribe and they are still with me. Yeah, the sense of connection is so important. And speaking of sense of connection, we, um, we have to end soon, but the last element of Spire, that's the E, the emotions. And here, um, I want to talk a little bit about the idea of the permission to be human because we're experiencing all different kinds of emotions right now, anxiety and frustration, um, and sometimes joy, and, and, and then again, sadness. So all kinds of emotions, and the key is to simply allow them in, to embrace them, because when we embrace, they flow through us, and they don't overstay their welcome. When we reject them, that's when they only strengthen. Yeah. So I wanted to end with the E with a, a poem because the emotion I'm most interested in cultivating in myself and in others is hope. But hope, interestingly enough, is really activated through action, through both visioning and action. So I thought I would bring to the audience this poem from Rosemary Watola Traumer. I want to live in that garden. What if tonight we all went to bed and thought of our best version of ourself? It wouldn't be true, of course, not in this moment and not tomorrow, not midweek, not next week, not even next year. But if we could picture it, it would be a goal we could live toward. It would be perhaps like the garden beds I prepared today, hoeing in the fertilizer, last year's grass clippings and leaves. When I was done, the rose still looked like dirt, but such fine dirt it was for planting. I believe in our resilience. What is best in us is eager to grow like the sunflower sprouts volunteering again this year. What if tonight 
We imagined the roots of our goodness. What if tonight we planted only those seeds? Wow, I love that. And Maria, I love the metaphor of the garden and um, an opportunity for all of us to plant those seeds, um, even, even during difficult times. Absolutely. I'm hopping in with a question from the audience. And we have Michelle from Boston asking you, making lemonade sounds really nice when it's warm, but in the East Coast, it's getting cold and dark. I can confirm that. What are your tools for us? I Well, living in the East Coast where it's getting cold and dark, um, Take and probably going to be a little more isolated rather than open and happy, which is how uh, at least the streets on New York City are now been like the past few weeks or even months. Yeah, I think, you know, in the session before they were talking about taking each child as an individual and considering the needs and the structures that support the child. And here I think we, we need to take each day as an individual day and literally consciously, mindfully, meditatively wake up in the morning and ask ourselves, how will we shape today? So to not look at the winter as this long journey of impossible darkness, which we can be prone to do, but rather today is one day I can influence, I can craft my living. And to what is it that will enliven me, cultivate that sense of hope within me, strengthen me, calm me today? That sounds uh, clever for any day. And thank you. I, I like that's a personal thank you for me. I'll use that. Hey, Tiles, do you, I, I, uh, a little bird told me that you potentially also have a song or a poem to share with us. I do want to share a poem. Thank you for asking. I thought you'd never ask. Ah, don't uh, so this is a poem by, uh, by Rumi. It was written in the 13th century. Uh, he's a Sufi poet, and it's called The Guest House. And before I read this poem, I would also like to urge um, the participants, please, in the chat, send your poems, and what IEC will do is collate them, and um, we can share these poems, these poems that even during the winter, during difficult uh, uh, times, can bring some warmth, at least, into our hearts. It's called The Guest House. This being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival. A joy, a depression, a meanness. Some momentary awareness comes in an, as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all, even if they are a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture. Still, treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice. Meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whatever comes because each has been sent as a guide from the beyond. I'm even more happy that I joined this uh, event now. Thank you both, that was wonderful. People are actually asking to get those poems, so I, I think we'll uh, share with it with them later. Um, so thank you so much for this uh, beautiful session. Thank you, Noga, thank you, and, thank you, IAC. And also inspired by your poems, by the way, I do wanna encourage all of you viewers to write songs or poems, share with us um, some songs that make you happy we will create a playlist out of it to hopefully use uh, upon Maria and Tal's advice. And by the way, no need to add Baby Shark. I already got that covered. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.